China and Honduras strengthen bilateral relations as the Honduran presidents visit Beijing. Hi, everyone. I'm Sean Caleb's filling in for Aden Naidu, and you're watching The Heat. Welcome, everyone. Chinese President Xi Jinping held talks with Honduran President Xiomara Castro on Monday. Castro is the first Honduran president to visit Beijing since the two nations established diplomatic ties back in March. Both nations are now preparing to bolster ties through a free trade agreement. CGTN's Dong Xue has this report. Welcoming the president from the Central American country, Honduras, on her first visit to China since establishing ties in March, Chinese President Xi Jinping held the visit as opening a new chapter in history. The two heads of state held talks in Beijing on Monday and witnessed a signing of 17 bilateral cooperation documents across an array of Belt and Road construction, economy, trade, agriculture, science and technology, culture and education. President Xi said the One China principle is the political foundation to further consolidate bilateral relations. He added, as the first female president of Honduras, Castro has been unifying and leading her people since coming to office in January last year. She showed a firm political will after making the historic decision to establish diplomatic relations with China. President Xi reiterated China will remain committed to developing friendly relations with Honduras, firmly support economic and social development in Honduras, and forge a good relationship and partnership with Honduras featuring mutual respect, equality, mutual benefit, and common development. President Castro, on the other hand, said she firmly supports the One China principle and she highly appreciated the Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative and the Global Civilization Initiative proposed by President Xi Jinping in order to build a peaceful and secure world. Castro's trip marks the latest step in a new relationship now guided by Honduran support for the One China principle. And the shift in policy is expected to bring economic benefits for this Central American country. Earlier, Chinese Foreign Minister Qin Gang said the historic meeting between President Xi and President Castro is a significant step as bilateral relations reach a new height and achieve new developments. Dong Xue, CGTN, Beijing. Okay, we're going to take a larger look at this, the growing relationship between China and Latin America. Let's bring in our guest now. Joining us from Beijing, Andy Mock. Andy's a senior research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. From Brazil, Gustavo Ribeiro. He is the founder and editor-in-chief of the Brazilian Report. Out of Nicaragua, Benjamin Norton, an investigative journalist and editor-in-chief of the Geopolitical Economy Report. And in Chile. Jorge Jaina. He is a former Chilean ambassador to China and current research professor at Party School of Global Studies at Boston University. I want to thank you all. Thank you all for taking time. It's a, it's a big story, growing story. Uh, let's get right to it. Uh, Jorge, if I could begin with you. In less than three months, if we look at what China and Honduras have, have, have accomplished, it's really pretty amazing how fast uh, the wheels really got in motion after this. Uh, just three months, they've established diplomatic ties, opened embassies in both nations, and now focused, of course, on a free trade agreement. How did the two countries get to this point so quickly? And clearly, what are some of the positives moving ahead, especially for Honduras? Yes, absolutely. I think this is a very significant step. And let me underscore the following. Uh, President Shumara Castro is visiting China for uh, six days. As it's just been said, she has signed uh, 17 agreements. Uh, she started in Shanghai, uh, where she visited the New Development Bank. And Honduras has expressed interest in joining the New Development Bank, as was known as the BRICS Bank. So again, uh, you know, this is a very significant event. Now, let me also say the following. Honduras is, according to some estimates, uh, the second poorest country in Latin America. Only Haiti is poorer than mm. Honduras. Its per capita income is around $2,700. It is coming out of a very difficult period uh, with very high violence, uh, with 
the drug trade, uh, you know, taking charge of many aspects of Honduras life. Uh, so, uh, Xiomara Castro, President Xiomara Castro has her hands full. So, this step that she is taking in establishing diplomatic relations and visiting uh, China is a major step towards trying to get uh, Honduras out of this uh, very difficult situation it finds itself. And I find it uh, very important. Of course, Honduras is only the latest of a number of Central American countries that in the, the past two years have done this. Mm, right. Since 2017, we have seen Panama, we have seen El Salvador, we have seen uh, Nicaragua, we have seen Dominican Republic in the Caribbean, uh, and now uh, we are seeing Honduras. So this is part of a broader trend in Central America and in the Western Hemisphere, in which these countries are realizing that they uh, are doing the right thing by establishing diplomatic relations with the PRC and opening right. the many trading and investment opportunities that opens. Uh, Andy, I want to pick up on that. Um, uh, as uh, Jorge just mentioned, 17 significant agreements have been signed. Uh, the Chinese president, of course, talking with uh, Xiamara Castro. Uh, what's the significance of this? Because not only is she the first female uh, president of Honduras, but she's also the first president to visit Beijing. So it's a time when many Latin American countries are turning their attention and their trade agreements over toward China. Uh, how is this going to help Honduras move forward? We heard Hori talk about just you know, how, uh, how poor that nation is and how it really struggles. Well, Sean, you're... <clears throat> Sean, you're absolutely correct. And I agree with Jorge that this is very, very important, could be transformational for Honduras, uh, given its current economic level of development. And we know that China, of course, has made history in terms of eradicating poverty within its borders mm. and many of the hard-won lessons uh, and, and the policies that were developed uh, could be very useful for countries around the world. But we also need to step back and look at this from a broader perspective. I think Jorge is completely right that this is having a very big impact on the Western Hemisphere. But there's actually global implications as well. So the, the premise here we have to all recognize and acknowledge is that China is looking to develop a more inclusive, just, and humane global order. And this affects not just the Western Hemisphere, but from the Solomon Islands to the Middle East with a rapprochement between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, that let's not lose sight as important, as exciting as these developments in Honduras, with Honduras, uh, are, that this is actually part of a much broader global change that we are witnessing. That's, that's interesting. And uh, Gustavo, this is something you and I have talked about uh, before. And of course, the United States is put in a position once again of having to react on what is promising economic news uh, for South America instead of being directly involved in it. Uh, Joe Biden today saying that he thinks of China as a strategic uh, competitor. And but this is one way. China is also strengthening ties, its educational ties, its cultural ties. But it is going to have a tremendous impact on the Cuban people. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, on the people of Honduras, uh, with half its population living in uh, poverty, facing the daunting task of rebuilding uh, its economy. And Castro clearly wants to tap into such items as BRICS uh, and the Asian Development Bank. What could that possibly mean uh, for Honduras as well moving forward? Well, one thing that is interesting is to see uh, how China has um, increased its influence in Latin America. And one of the reasons for that is, for instance, uh, China is, has been a big loaner of a uh, lender of money for Latin American countries, which has uh, allowed many of these countries to invest in infrastructure. Uh, Argentina, for instance, a lot of uh, infrastructure projects linked to energy. In Brazil, uh, China is uh, a ba major uh, investor. And um, a, a lot of the countries where, uh, to which China has lent money are countries that have a hard time finding financing with many uh, multilateral organizations. So this is uh, one major um, step for China to increase further its influence here. And it's important to uh, also point that uh, 
the, Latin America has been the back burner of American foreign policy. And we have seen China, uh, for instance, with COVID vaccines, the first ones here were not from uh, Western countries, but rather from China. So we are seeing trade that uh, China is already uh, the number one trading partner for South America, number two uh, for the entire Latin American region. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is uh, a presence that is more and more felt. Yeah, and uh, to back up what you're saying, 300 million vaccine doses came from China to Honduras uh, at the start uh, of the pandemic, certainly something very important. Benjamin, let's shift a bit more and, and talk about how these two nations are going to gel moving forward. Clearly, uh, trade means so much. And if you look back to the year 2000, I believe that the trade accounted for only about 2% of the trade in Latin America. And just look what China has done, not only grown its economy so incredibly since uh, the year 2000, but what it means to Latin America. How did the Belt and Road Initiative, how did other Chinese policies work into that way, and what does it mean moving forward? Well, it's very important for the region in a variety of ways. I mean, this is a region that has suffered from underdevelopment and poverty. So, I mean, just having the, the model of China with 800 million Chinese people lifted out of poverty in the past five decades, I mean, um, being able to learn from China's example is important for a lot of these countries. But also it's important because it provides another political and economic alternative for many of these countries in Latin America, which have a history of um, intervention by the United States. In the case of Honduras, we can't understand the current government without keeping in mind that Samara Castro's husband, Manuel Zelaya, was president, and he was overthrown in a coup in 2009. And the United States supported that coup. And this has been an important part of the rhetoric of the government and the Libre Party, the left-wing party of Samara mm -hmm. Castro, that they do not want another coup to happen. And this means that the country not only needs to diversify its political partnerships, but also its economic partnerships. Because like neighboring Nicaragua, Honduras relies very heavily on exports to the United States. The, the U.S. market represents about one-third of all of uh, Honduras's exports. So it needs to diversify its trade partners because the possibility also is that eventually Honduras could face sanctions. And I think for, you know, there's a lot of collaboration between the uh, left-wing Libre Party in Honduras and the, the Sandinista Party here in Nicaragua. And Nicaragua is a country that's under sanctions by the United States and has been looking for new economic partnerships, just as Cuba and, and, and Venezuela have been under sanctions. So Honduras is trying to diversify its relations politically and economically, right. and it's trying to lift the country out of poverty. So China is the perfect partner for that. And Jorge, also, um, Honduras is one of the latest nations to embrace the one China policy, and that means so much, obviously, to the leaders uh, in China, and it certainly paves the road for better relations. Talk to me a bit about what that is going to mean from a diplomatic standpoint, and we really haven't talked about the educational ties and the cultural ties, how much that could help Honduras moving forward. Jorge? I'm sorry. Um, I don't think we have Jorge at the moment. Uh, Andy, if, if I can pose that question to you, um, if you need to be repeated, I'd be glad to, but I'm sure you've probably got the gist of it. Sure. Uh, well, Sean, you know, as we've heard, Honduras uh, is struggling, has been struggling economically. And if we look at the reasons for this, actually, there are historical causes. So the American writer, O. Henry, coined the term banana republic. Mm referring to uh, a corrupt government that exploits its own people. Uh, based on his experience in Hondura, Honduras and uh, American fruit companies, so I think what then China brings to the table to answer your question uh, in terms of educational exchanges, cultural exchanges, technical exchanges, is really first no historical baggage and the ability to truly work with uh, Honduras, the government of Honduras, the Honduran people. Uh, as equals, as, as China has often said, uh, on the basis of mutual respect, uh, not in an exploitive way. So I think this is an enormous positive. It's uh, likely to cause geopolitical ripples, uh, if not larger repercussions, as I think uh, countries in the region now see new opportunities and new options. Interesting. Um, 
Benjamin, you're an, an investigative journalist. I want to kind of pose this uh, to you because it's something we hear from the United States so much. But first, let me begin with this quote talking about the one China policy and uh, really what it is going to mean in the relationship between Honduras and China moving forward. Uh, quote, uh, it comes from Lorenzo Maggiorelli, a professor of international relations at Pontifical Javierina University in Bogota. Uh, Taipei has tried and still tries to retain its diplomatic allies in the region through foreign aid. Nevertheless, China's increased trade and investment relevance in the region made Taiwanese aid less and less important compared to the opportunities being offered by Beijing. And in terms of countering that, the United States is, I guess, trying to downplay, it's the only thing I could think of, by saying China is setting up debt traps. Uh, mm. Tell me what you think about the quote, uh, first from the prof professor, what it means, and is the, is the debt trap fair in any way? Well, no, the debt trap is not fair. It's pure projection. If there is a country that has a history of trapping Latin American countries in debt, it's precisely the United States, not China. As for Taipei, I mean, uh, authorities on Taiwan Island actually have a history of extreme corruption, especially in Central America, which until recently was one of the only regions of the world that refused to establish formal diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China. In El Salvador, for instance, when it still recognized Taipei, one of the most well-known examples of corruption was a former president who was put under house arrest because Taipei gave El Salvador millions of dollars in so-called aid, and he actually pocketed all of that aid. So essentially, the Taipei's strategy in alliance with the United States is to bribe leaders in the region to prevent them from establishing formal diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China. And in the case of the region, it's also very important to keep in mind that there are only 12 countries on Earth representing 0.49 percent of the global population who refuse to establish formal diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China, maintaining relations with Taipei. And half of those countries are in Latin America and the Caribbean. And the, the most populous of those countries is actually Guatemala, the other Central American neighbor of Honduras. So Taipei has put a lot of resources into essentially bribing leaders in the region mm. to prevent them from establishing ties with China. And in, in the most recent election in Honduras, there were allegations that were well substantiated that Taipei authorities were actually meddling in the election in support of the conservative National Party to prevent Samara Castro from winning the election because she had pledged during her campaign that she would establish relations with the People's Republic of China. So unfortunately, Taipei has played, the authorities on Taiwan Island have played a pretty negative role and an undemocratic role in the region. And that's another reason why so many countries are establishing ties with the People's Republic of China. And that's why we like to have an investigative journalist in our program, all those numbers at the tip of your fingers. Thanks so much. Uh, Jorge, let's talk more about that, though. The diplomatic relations, clearly uh, your experience in diplomatic uh, relations, diplomacy, uh, what is it going to mean to, to Honduras? How does it, do you, do you expect that the, Latin America is going to continue to distance itself from, I'm sure, what it, it thinks of the United States as trying to act like it's its big brother all these years, uh, offering some uh, some like a, a benefactor rather than a trade equal. There certainly is that feeling out there. Uh, your thoughts on that? Hmm. I'm sorry, we're having a great deal of difficulty getting our information out uh, of there. I'm going to move on, uh, Gustavo. Let me go to you. Uh, we are seeing a shift in Latin America, as I was talking about, with the companies, uh, with these countries governed by left-wing political parties are establishing ties with China. And the diplomat reported these relations because of two developments. And here's yet another quote for you. On the one hand, diplomatic and economic ties have been largely reinvigorated due to the pronounced political affinity of these governments with Beijing. On the other hand, the relationship still primarily serves each country's specific preferences and is underlined by consistent pragmatic pragmatism from both China and Latin American states. Let me get your, your thoughts on that, if I can, please. 
Yes, I, I think that uh, having uh, stronger ties with Beijing, uh, regardless of politics, is one way that countries can have more leverage in negotiations with the United States. It has been historically a very one-sided relationship. And but for instance, uh, we we ha uh, can we can see Lula, Brazil's mm. president. He went both to uh, Washington and to Beijing, and he did try to pander to these two countries in order to establish Brazil as uh, a equidistant from two. He went first to Washington, but then uh, the entourage that he brought to Beijing was far greater. Uh, he signed uh, uh, several uh, deals with uh, Xi Jinping. He, ha he had more to show for. Uh, from his Beijing visit then to his Washington visit. Uh, so I think that uh, um, many countries that have, uh, like uh, the fellow panelist said, uh, traumatic relations historically with the U.S., see uh, a rapprochement with Beijing as a way to extract more from their relationship with the U.S. And we saw this, for instance, in Brazil uh, with the debate around uh, 5G, uh, a lot of uh, Western countries wanted Brazil to ban Huawei, and Brazil didn't do it. was right. the government of uh, far-right President Jair Bolsonaro, and uh, even him, uh, in a pragmatic way, uh, kept Huawei as a possible government contractor in regards to 5G. And Gustavo, if I could broaden that just a bit, uh, one of the headlines I read before coming out basically said that the West is making it easy for China to succeed, basically misstep after misstep, and the fact that the United States spent trillions over the last 20 years fighting wars when China was building economic ties with many nations around the world. Yes, I mean, we can say, like, like I said before, in terms of the vaccines, the first vaccines that came uh, to Brazil were Chinese vaccines. Uh, we can also say, for instance, uh, there has been negotiations around the Mercosur uh, EU deal for more than 20 years, and we still have uh, countries like France, which have very strong agricultural lobbies blocking this deal, which would ver be very beneficial for farmers in the region. And as opposed to that, we see uh, these gushing flows of uh, money in trade and um, in investments uh, from China and to China. Um, we see, for instance, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, the EU, EU top official, uh, he's making her first trip just now. He's, uh, she was in Brazil today visiting with Lula. She's heading to Buenos Aires tomorrow. So, uh, like I said, uh, Latin America was on the back burner for Europe and for uh, the U.S. for several years recently. And uh, they just uh, uh, did nothing while China was increasing its ties with most countries in the region. And for instance, trade between China and Latin America mm -hmm. has increased by 20-fold oh, yeah, since China joined the World Trade Organization. Yeah, and um, uh, Benjamin, if, if, I'm, if the numbers are correct, the ones I've been reading, that trade could jump to $700 billion with Latin America by the year 2035. Now, Honduras obviously isn't the only Latin American country that China has made significant inroads are. Uh, the others, which you talked about as well, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Dominica Republic, and Panama, you are in Nicaragua. Tell me what differences you have noticed. Well, it's absolutely huge. I mean, I mentioned that Taipei has a history of essentially using what you could call aid money, although it's not the best word, to essentially bribe politicians to maintain diplomatic relations. And this was true in uh, during the years of conservative governments in Nicaragua. The Sandinista Revolution happened in 1979, and the Sandinistas were pushed out of power in 1990. And there were a series of conservative governments from 1990 until 2006. And in fact, the Sandinistas originally had established relations with the People's Republic of China. But when the conservatives came to power in 1990, they broke relations with the People's Republic and formed relations with Taipei. And essentially, Taipei was using that so-called aid money to pressure the government to maintain relations. And ever since uh, just two years ago, when the Nicaraguan government reestablished ties with the People's Republic, the, the Chinese government has provided a lot of much more substantial report, support than Taipei ever did. So for instance, the head of the Chinese Agency for International Development just visited Nicaragua and announced support for building thousands of public housing units which is a very important priority for the government. Of course, Nicaragua, Honduras's neighbor, is another country that suffers from underdevelopment and poverty, and the government has prioritized poverty reduction 
and creating public housing. Another very important infrastructure project is a, an interoceanic canal. Right now, Panama has a monopoly on canals in the region, and China and, and Nicaragua are working together on creating a canal, which would be a massive economic game changer, not only for Nicaragua, but for the rest of Central America, which would bring in so much more economic activity to help fight poverty. Well, that absolutely would. I'd love to follow up more on that. Uh, now, Andy, uh, Honduras has already submitted an application for admission into the uh, New Development Bank. We've talked about it earlier in the program to, uh, briefly. What about joining BRICS? Uh, do you think that's a possibility? And uh, how are these new financial entities that are now available to so many Latin countries, how long before you think that the world really starts seeing uh, results of all of this? Well, I think we're already seeing results, Sean. Certainly, uh, with the Belt and Road Initiative, what was called the BRICS Bank, that's called the New Development Bank, BRICS uh, in general. So uh, I think that certainly uh, it's a very bright path forward for Honduras to uh, be more closely aligned uh, with the New Development Bank, um, other institutions and organizations of which China plays a role for one very important reason. So we all can uh, be bedazzled Mm -hmm. by some of the amazing things we see in, in Beijing, Shanghai, high-speed rail, airports, et cetera. But we mustn't forget, China is still a developing country. And what this means is that it is intimately familiar with the real challenges of development, increasing people's livelihoods in a sustainable way, health, education. Uh, whereas countries like the United States, you know, because they are so developed, because they have a certain mindset, uh, that their way is the best, whether or not it really is suited for local circumstances, uh, might not always be the best fit. So mm -hmm. yeah. for this reason, um, Honduras being more engaged in these organizations will be very, very valuable. And to Ben's point, you know, what I hear from uh, diplomatic friends in Beijing about their countries is that uh, when China comes to visit, they get a hospital or a stadium. When the U.S. comes to visit, they get a lecture. So, you know, it's not a surprise that more and more countries see the value of this win-win uh, uh, relationship with China that's based on mutual respect, does not demand uh, ideological conformity, in a way, selling one's integrity, really, as it were. Yeah. Uh, ben, I'm going to give you the last word. We only have about 35 seconds, but tell me where you see, see the China-Latin American relationship going, because I think Andy talked about one thing. China's a nation with 1.4 billion people. It does need the resources that it could get from Latin America. The trade is only going to increase, especially as China's economy grows. According to a purchasing power parity measurement, China's economy has already been larger than the U.S. economy pretty soon. In a nominal GDP measurement, China's economy will be larger. It's growing about 5% per year, while the U.S. economy is largely stagnant. So we're going to see Chinese Latin American trade continue to grow, and we're going to see more and more countries in the region, especially in South America, join the BRICS. Argentina has already applied to join. Mexico has said that it's interested in joining. Uruguay is in the process of joining the BRICS bank. And yep. we can expect other countries in the region to do so as well. So it's going to be an overall economic partnership of countries okay. in the global south ben, that have I'm sorry, we're... development needs working together for their mutual benefit. I hate to cut you off, but we're going to hit bars in just a minute. I want to thank you all very much. Very enlightening discussion. We're going to leave it there. I'm Sean Caleb's in Washington. Thanks for watching another edition of The Heat.